Hello everybody. Today we're going to deal with a very basic concept in geology. We're going to answer this question. How is a rock formed? This may seem like a pretty obvious question to most of you and that's fine, but someone did ask me to do it. I have a little time, so I'm going to do it now. It's actually really bad outside. It's what, March I think 8th, 2024, and it's pouring out there right now. So they actually let us work from home today. But anyway, I'm done with that, so pass that. <laughs> so, how is a rock formed? Well, where do we want to start? <laughs> this is probably the bigger question. Let's go all the way back. I mean, ultimately, what happened was every rock you see on Earth today or any other planet in the solar system formed from the initial nebula collapse that created our solar system okay let's look at nebula collapse as that nebula um that was about five ish billion years ago or so a little less than that as for where that nebula was we don't know we do have some stars that we think formed from that nebula that we are aware of we we use this by looking at their trajectory through the galaxy, something like that. They're called uh, solar siblings. There's a few candidates. They don't have to look and be like our sun to have formed out of the same nebula. nebula nebulas will produce different types of stars, you know, that doesn't, uh, doesn't have to be like our sun, at least not in size. And you know, Anyway, <laughs> before that, the sun, that nebula formed from some sort of dying star or stars. And that probably happened, we think, about 6 billion years ago, maybe a little more than that, that that star that shed the material out into the nebula or into an area that would become a nebula, and that nebula would become our sun, okay? Before that, we don't really know. And remember, larger stars, even though they're bigger, they burn their fuel quicker and they die faster. That's why blue giants, which are hot, blue is hot on the playing scale. It's not cold. Red is cold. White's in the middle. All right. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, those hot blue stars live fast and die hard. Our sun takes uh, about 10 billion years. It's actually about 9.6 to burn its fuel before it starts becoming a subgiant and giant. And then eventually, It'll just shed its outer skin. It's not going to go supernova. It will just, series of minor novas. It's not big enough to go supernova. You know, by then Earth will be gone anyway, so it doesn't matter. We're about halfway through that right now. Okay, so the nebula collapses and it forms our solar system. That material was gas and dust. Now, as our planet formed and most of the other planets, what happened was that dust began to collapse and spin into a disk. The sun is at the center, and that has, I forget the exact number, 98 to 99% of the mass of the solar system is in our sun. All the other planets are not that big compared to our sun, not massive-wise anyway. So what that did was that, you know, created what would become the Earth, you know, it kept collecting material. Well, when you start pounding things into things and more and faster and the bigger they get and the bigger the impactors, you generate a lot of heat. And we believe a Mars-sized object called what we call Theia smashed into the Earth. It wasn't a direct bullet-on impact. It didn't destroy the Earth. The Earth was going to survive this. It was much more massive and larger. But this Theia object was disintegrated, and most of it was either reincorporated into the Earth that was forming, or it became our moon. And at that time, pretty much, you could the planet was molten. All right, There were no rocks yet, per se. There were rocks in the solar system, just not at that point. Well, Earth cools the... Uh, moon cooled and eventually we formed a crust
we're just going to deal with the earth now, which was made of rock that formed from that cooling, that molten concoction. Because technically magma and lava are not rocks. They aren't liquid versions of rocks. Rocks, by definition, have to be solids. Okay, so it's... We will often call it melted rock, but it's not actual rock. It's just to let you know that melt can form a rock. Okay, so it's a chemical concoction, but this, the crust is a rock. Time goes by, the earth starts resurfacing itself, and all rocks, now we're just going to talk about that, start out as melts, ultimately. That's why I gave you this big rant about the solar system. I'm not going to say magma or lava. We're, we're talking about, the, you know, m you know, molten rock. We're talking about melts, all right? Now, what happens is that chemical concoction will cool on Earth, all right? And that will start to form minerals within that melt. Minerals also, by definition, are solids. And since rocks are made up of minerals, they are solids, okay? So minerals start to form. Now, some of you may already know this is going. More and more minerals will form as this cools, this melt, following Bones Reaction Series, and ultimately what we'll get out of that is some sort of igneous rock. Now, I'm not doing the rock cycle here per se, okay? We're gonna go through the life of just a hypothetical rock here, okay? Now we know igneous rocks themselves can be remelted and they can become other rocks. And we're gonna do that here. So let's say we get minerals that are mostly, uh, let's see, stuff like plagioclase, we'll just say plage, case bar, and quartz. So becomes We'll just say granite, all right? That igneous rock is underground eventually. It is brought to the surface and exposed to weathering. So chemical and physical weathering occurs. Rain pelts this thing, all right? Wind hits this thing. The wind doesn't do much. Most of it's the rain or stream. Weathering via water causes both physical and chemical weathering. Water will react with the feldspars, which will create certain minerals, which will weather out. And those minerals are stable on Earth's surface. On uh, Venus, they wouldn't be, but on Earth's surface, they're stable. And so now out of that igneous rock, we are breaking it down into sediment, all right? We are dealing with both mechanical, mostly the quartz is going to weather. These are both feldspars, by the way. Uh, the quartz is going to just be mechanically weathered down. Quartz is extremely stable on the surface of the planet. It doesn't react with anything. It just gets pelted and becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. That's mechanical weathering. Chemical weathering actually alters the chemistry of these minerals. And the that sediment... So it breaks down. Ultimately, we're, their sediment here is going to give us clays from these feldspars and quartz sand, but we'll just say sand, all right, from this. I mean, these can mechanically weather too, all right? They can be broken down and they'll form things like arcos, arcosic sands, but talk for another time. So we're just going to say we get clays and sand. Our clays and sand, they move around, they get transported by rivers and wind and whatever, and eventually get deposited into a sub slowly subsiding basin. Whether that's in the interior of a continent, in a lake, or a big, big lake, it doesn't matter. But our sediment gets deposited in there, more sediment gets deposited on top, and eventually a process called lithification occurs so we'll just say that and that be is be, that process forms what we basically will call a rock all right when most people think of a rock it's this 
in geology and in stratigraphy and sedimentology, we don't really distinct in duration and hardness has nothing to do with whether or not it's a rock unit. We will name unconsolidated sediments as rock units in stratigraphy. All right. It doesn't matter because, you know, I know engineers do that. But really, where is that line? I mean, I know people in like Ohio, they have this engineers call it clay shale. That's not really a term geologists use, but they can core. It's a really crappy shale that's not completely indurated. And you can core that or you can dig it out with a shovel, <laughs> you know. So is it a rock or is it a sediment? Who cares? Only engineers care about that stuff. All right. So lithification occurs. And we get a sedimentary rock, all right? Now, out of a granite, clays, and sands, we are going to, dominantly, this is going to be made up of feldspars, our granite, okay? Quartz is a major component, but I think it's less than, what is it off the top of my head? I don't remember. Less than half-ish of a granite? Anyway... I forget, and I work with it all the time. Anyway, so let's just say your clays, as they get transported, not all of it's gonna get lithified. Some of that clay, which is subject to wind and the sand is not so much. Yes, you can blow sand, I get that, but it's larger, it's uh, you know more massive. It's not gonna move as easily. So a lot of the clays are transported somewhere else. So your, your sedimentary rock is basically going to be a, we'll just say, argillaceous, I think I spelled that right, argillaceous sandstone, okay? Uh, this, we would actually, this would be a wacky, <laughs> if we, if this is a sandstone, but I will do sandstone classifications at another time. So you'll, this is the kind of thing you'll see, argillaceous is a term that just means clay, I've even, or fine-grained, you know, fine-grained stuff within the sandstone enough to, for it to be noticeable, okay? So, yeah, we have an argillaceous sandstone or a wacky, quartz wacky in this case. So now our sedimentary rock, we're rock now, gets buried just in whatever basin, and a continent comes and collides either hitting that basin or coming very close to it, forming a mountain range. So we're gonna start another process called metamorphism. Okay? As that rock gets folded and deformed in anticlines, synclines, and faults form, we are going to increase pressure and temperature without melting the rock. And that metamorphism gives us metamorphic rock. This would basically just be, maybe you probably call it a quartzite, you call it a argillaceous quartzite or something like that, since it's mostly quartz sand, but you could call it that. I don't want to get into the nuances too much of classifying this thing in detail because that's not the focus of this. So we'll just say you know, you get a, I'm just going to call it a muddy quartzite, okay? So this does happen. There's a lot of them, especially in Precambrian. So you get a muddy quartzite. Or you could say, or you could say, you know what? You could say slaty quartzite. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's say slaty, sorry. Let's say you get a slate quartzite okay so now we have the slaty quartzite quartz is very stable throughout the metamorphic process usually if you have a quartz if you have a quartzite it's it's low grade we're talking zeolite facies which i don't really even consider metamorphic and lower green schist facies okay so that or middle green schist you start going too high quartz is the last thing to crystallize when forming a granite because it forms at such low temperatures when i say low i'm talking 600 degrees centigrade okay so the so 
the reverse of that is it's going to be one of the first things to melt if it's metamorphosed too much, all right? So, but our metamorphic rock, our slaty quartzite, it goes, gets buried underground again. And this time it's not going to come back to the surface. This continental collision has buried a lot of it deep enough where some of it does start to melt again. So we melt and we get back and we can begin again. Now, some of you may be like, Steve, that's not exactly what the rock cycle is, but I already said, I'm not doing the rock cycle. I'm taking you through the life of a rock, okay? How it forms going all the way back to the formation of the solar system. Now, metamorphic rocks can undergo further metamorphism and become more highly metamorphosed. Eventually, just about anything except the quartzite, except the pure quartzite, is going to become a schist. And that's because that's such a high grade metamorphism that even mudstones like siltstones and shales, there's so much recrystallization from the heat and pressure that you can't really tell it from a highly deformed. I mean, there are ways, but if you just, if I just picked each one up that I knew one, the protolith was sedimentary of a schist and one was igneous and put them in front of you, probably wouldn't be able to pick out which is which. I probably wouldn't be able to unless I knew more about it or could look at it in detail. Ezra's Trinkets is still available on Redbubble, but it's also available now on Printify. The advantage to it over Redbubble is that you have a wider range of products. You have things like all over print t-shirts, sweatshirts, puzzles, playing cards, calendars, and a host of many other products. So please, check out Ezra's Trinkets on Printify. It's not just a geology shop. There's plenty of stuff in there for everyone. Hope you enjoy it. We hope you order something. So metamorphic rocks can become more metamorphic. Igneous rocks can get remelted and become igneous rocks again. Sediment can get melted and become igneous rock or undergo heat and pressure become metamorphic rock. Igneous and metamorphic rock and sediment itself, sedimentary, I'm oh, sorry, I meant, should have wrote sedimentary, oh I did, sedimentary rock, can weather and become sediments, okay? <laughs> and then go back to becoming sedimentary rock. I didn't want to do the rock cycle here and that wasn't what I was asked to do because you can find that anywhere. I just, I wanted to take you through the life of the formation of some rock. Now, you may be asking, how long does this take? Well, we know this is about five billion years ago. We know Earth crossed, you know, the moon and the impact Theia was in here somewhere. Uh, Earth is about 4.5, you know, billion. That's the GA, is this giga annum. This could be anywhere. And quite honestly, this could be from a rift forming, or it could be from a volcano. But that melt, in order to get a granite or a granitoid, you need some time. Depending on the chemistry of that rock, it could take, you know, a few years, or it could take a few hundred thousand years, okay? It does, there's no such, it takes a while. It's not something that happens overnight, okay? So you get your igneous rock and that erodes into sediment and eventually becomes clays and sands. How long does that take? Well, if you're talking about the weathering of a batholith, of a granite batholith, that could take millions of years. If you're talking about a granite boulder, it's not gonna happen in your lifetime, but probably a few hundred thousand. Okay, it's not gonna take that long. All right, it's a matter of scale in a lot of this too. And then the sediment, depending on how long it's blowing around out there, reacting with other things, being deposited, redeposited, 
you could be talking about once this is weathered in the sediment, you talk about it being transported in a couple days and settling into a basin, like at that granitoid's right on the edge of a basin. Or it could blow around and kick around for millions of years. You know, this is why we don't really mess with depositional rates that much anymore, unless we have a strong bounded top and bottom of a geologic unit, you know, dated like a lava layer above and below. So in the lithification process, it depends. We used to think that was a sign of age. As a matter of fact, the oldest glacial deposits uh, were a little harder than the more recent ones, and that along with geomorphology, how hilly, how cut the till, till was, would be an indication of age, you know? But now it's really not. Granted, you're not gonna find any unconsolidated Precambrian sediments, okay? The earth is just too old. Those have been preserved via orogenies and mountain building events. The heck was I step on? So those are well indurated. Most of those are metamorphosed to some degree. So, you know, lithification, it depends. You go to the Pennsylvanian, and it doesn't have to be equal throughout the unit. You go to the Pennsylvania deposits in Illinois, and the shales, a lot of times, aren't even really indurated. The coal will be, the limestone will be, the sandstone is usually not well indurated either. You just scratch it out with your hands most of the time. So even the same unit, you know, or system, in this case, Pennsylvanian, doesn't have to be fully one or the other. It can be a mixture. Most of the Mesozoic sediments in Western United States and Canada haven't been deeply buried enough to be really lithified that much. And things don't have to undergo pressure and more sediments building on top of them to become lithified. Certain minerals, groundwater moving through it can do that. Like if you have very iron rich groundwater, well, that's gonna deposit hematite and it's gonna, you know, harden that rock. Even though the rock 10 feet away might not, or 10 feet above might be above the groundwater table and you can scoop it out with a spoon. See, this is why geologists don't care about induration. The Henry Formation, which is glacial, and it's actually in my Illinois book, The Outcrop, you go to the side of this exposure, I forget if it's by a, I think it's by a road, and it's relatively hard. I mean, you can't just scratch in it. You got to hit it with your rock hammer to get chunks to break off, but that deposit's only 10,000 years old, you know, but if you go on top and you were to go back and dig and the formation goes all the way to the top and it's got topsoil on it obviously and, and grass and stuff but you go back you know 10 feet three meters start digging a hole with a shovel it's like going through sand it's occasionally you're going to have to get hit a pebble and you're going to have to move that but it's not indurated. That's because the face of that Henry formation, the groundwater and stuff moving through it, carries dissolved carbonates with it. And that carbonate doesn't get deposited until it reaches the front of that cliff. And that makes the front of that cliff hard. Okay, this is, even though lithologically, it's the same unit. It, you can't, it's all other aspects, it's the exact same unit. So lithologically, it would be the same formation. Like I said, only engineers care about hardness, okay? But this is coming up on 25 minutes. I hope that helps. I hope that helps increase your understanding a little bit. Remember, the only dumb question is a question not asked, as long as it is a question coming from honesty. Uh, there are no stupid questions unless they're flat earth questions and they're pretty stupid. But anyway, that's it. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below, and I hope you learned something.